حسب اشوف عندي موعد عندي عقد قران اذا ما كان اذا تنتظرون ما عندي مانع ماكو مانع ان شاء الله يلا يلا امير بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين My dear brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I would like to welcome you all to Sunday uh, program. Uh, it is always refreshing to be among my dear brothers and sisters in this beautiful setting in which we find ourselves all as members of one family, alhamdulillah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. قل تعالوا أتل ما حرم ربكم عليكم ألا تشركوا به شيئا وبالوالدين إحسانا ولا تقتلوا أولادكم من إملاق نحن نرزقكم وإياهم. <coughs> sociologists believe that there are two sets of deterrent: external and internal. External deterrent is like having police in the street. They deter you from committing crime. Having cops, cops in the street would definitely stop many people who are intent on committing crimes from committing crimes. And then we have the internal deterrent that deter people from committing crimes such as your faith, such as what we call conscience, and such as your strong moral compass. Those are considered our internal deterrent. They help us internally to avoid committing crimes. Now, which deterrent is more effective, the internal or the external? Which one has more impact on me in stopping me from committing crimes? A police officer or my own strong faith? Obviously, my strong faith, my fear of God has more impact than the police officer. The reason being is that the police officer can deter me as long as there is a police officer. But when there is no police officer, then a police officer cannot deter me. While my faith is always there, it never disappears. A police officer may disappear, but my faith, my fear of God is always there. It never disappears. If I rely only on external deterrent, that means if that deterrent is available, does, does exist, exist, then it, it will, will deter me. Otherwise, 
it's, it's not, not going, going. I will not be deterred. deterred. You, know, you know, and in, in New York, York in 1978, 1978, I was not in the United, United States, States back then. then. Many, Many of you were. were. 1978, almost 40 years ago, the electricity was gone for not more than 24 hours. Not more than 24 hours. Completely shut down. There was no electricity in the state of New York 40 years ago. In that day, at night of that day, when the electricity was gone, over 24,000 24, crimes were recorded. From robbery, to rape, to you name it. Why? Because there, was no, because there were no police officers at the scene. Police officers were not there. Something that coincides with, 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 with the outage of electricity. And thousands of crimes were committed that day. So, if I rely on, on the police to deter me, what would happen when the police go on strike? What would happen when our city is understaffed with the police officers? We don't have enough police officers. The crime will go up sharply. Therefore, there are nations, there are nations such as Japan, from day one, they teach the children in the school, kindergarten, preschoolers, they teach them how to have strong personality, immunity, not, not to, to steal, not, not to commit, to commit crime, crime without, without the need, need to have a police officer. officer. You, know, you know, in, in Japan, Japan, I have been to Japan, Japan some, I guess, 17, 18 years ago. Uh, it's, it's amazing how, how safe, safe this country, country is. is. Completely safe. Hardly, hardly, hardly a robbery takes place. place. Hardly. I, I remember when, when we, uh, we, we were, were checking, checking into our hotel, hotel I asked the receptionist uh, if there are safe boxes in the room, because, you know, usually you have your wallet. Your... So he told me that, why are you asking about safe boxes? He said, because I want to put my personal belongings. He says... In Japan, Japan, everywhere is safe. You, you don't, don't need, need a safe box. box. And, and if you know anybody who traveled to Japan, they will attest to this. That, that there is no safe box in your room, room because your room is, is already safe. safe. They, they have raised their nation on being deterred not, not by the police. Not, not by, by the police. police. But... <clears throat> By, by their, their immune system, system by, by their, the, the way, way they, they were, were brought up. So, so in, in the Quran, Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about a few internal deterrents. And, and by the way, all the religions, all the religions, especially the divine religions, such as Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, they all emphasize the role of the internal deterrent. That I need to avoid committing crimes regardless, regardless whether there is a police officer or not. They create this immunity in us that stops us from committing crime, whether there is camera watching us, us or not. not. In, In some, some countries, countries 
in the most advanced countries in the West. The only way they rely on keeping the law and order is by installing millions of cameras. I was reading in the city of London, UK, 10 years ago, the government, the city, the city of Dearborn, uh, the city of London, decided to install six million cameras in all London streets so they can watch everybody. So villains cannot be immune anymore. They are being watched. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is creating another system in which people are deterred from committing crime without the need for six million cameras, without the need for dispatching or deploying thousands of police officers in the street. I have something within me that deters me from committing crime. And that, and that is, is my faith, faith my strong faith, faith. My, my consciousness, consciousness. My, my fear, fear of God. God. And, and this, this is what really matters. matters. Because, because again, again if, if I, I rely only, only on external deterrent, deterrent on, on cameras, on police, on police officers, officers, then what, what would happen, happen when, when there is no camera, camera? when there when is there no, is no police, police officer? officer. People, people would take advantage, advantage of the situation. situation. But, but when, when I create this deterrent within you, then, then no, no matter whether there is a police officer or there, or there isn't, isn't, there, there are, are cameras, cameras or there, are, there, there aren't. aren't. So, so it is, it is the, the moral compass. compass. It, is it is the moral, moral compass. compass. Islam, Islam and, and all religions, religions they, they attempt to create this moral compass in us that, that I have, have to be conscious of my actions. Anything, anything I commit, I need, I need to think, think about, about it before, before committing it. it. Am, I Am I allowed to, to do this or not? not? If my, if my moral compass, compass allows me, me then, then yes, yes, I go, I go ahead. ahead. If, if my moral compass tells me no, when, when Joseph, Joseph was, was with Zuleikha, Zuleikha was a married woman, and Yusuf, and Yusuf was single. single. She, she was, was the most beautiful, beautiful woman, woman in Egypt. Egypt. And, and probably, probably Yusuf was the most handsome man in Egypt. When, when she, she came after him, him demanding that, that he, would he would do something, something haram, what, what did it stop Yusuf, Joseph, Joseph from, from committing haram? Police? police? There, was there was no police. police. Cameras? cameras? There, there were, were no cameras, cameras back, back then. then. The, the only, only thing that deterred him, him from, from committing, committing Something, something immoral with, with this married woman, woman is قال I am I feel God I feel God there was, there was a, a, a statute an idol that she, that she used to worship, to worship. She, she had, had him, him in her, in her bedroom, bedroom. She, she went, went she, she brought, brought a sheet, and she, and she covered, covered the, the statute. And, and uh, Yusuf asked, asked her, why did you do this? Why did, why did you cover, you cover this idol with the, with the sheet? She says, because, because I'm embarrassed, embarrassed to do something before this idol. She says, you're, you're embarrassed, embarrassed to do something, something before this Harmless, this, this benefitless idol, idol you, yet, you're yet you're not, not embarrassed from God? From God? You're, you're afraid, afraid from this small, small little, little idol, idol and, and you're, you're not, not afraid, afraid of God? God? Ni'a'khaf Allah. 
I'm afraid, I'm afraid from, from God. God. I, will I will not do that. Do that. She, she chased him. And he, and he ran away. away. And, then and then they, they found, found the man, her husband, at the door. At the door. And, you know and you know the rest of the rest story. Of the story. So, so what did stop Yusuf? He was, he was a young, young man, man, a single, single man, man, full of lusts and, and desires. He has, he has no, no wife. He, he had no girlfriend. girlfriend. And, and here there is the most, the most beautiful, beautiful woman telling, telling him, Hey, hey tell come, come on, I am ready for you. you. What did it stop him? If he, if he didn't, didn't have, have that moral compass, compass in him, he would have, have done it easily. easily. And, nobody and nobody could have, have noticed. noticed. But it is his moral compass. It is, it is that, that inner deterrent. That's, That's why... Islam, Islam wants, wants us to, to have, have that deterrent. deterrent. Not, Not only, only a police is stopping us. What, what if, if there is no police? What, what if, if there is no camera? camera? Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Qul ta'alaw, come, come let, let me read, read to you, list to you, what, what morally your Lord has forbade you, from, from doing. doing. The, the first, first one, Allah to shriku bi shay'a. Make sure you do, you do not ascribe partner to God. That, that is, is number one, one, my dear brothers and sisters. Do not, do not worship anyone other than beside God. Many, Many people ask, do we, do we really worship these, these days anyone, anyone other than God? God? We Muslims, Muslims alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, worship God. God. Christians worship God, God too. The Jews, Jews also worship God. God. So, so why this emphasis that, that the, the Quran, Quran keeps, keeps emphasizing? emphasizing. Do, not do not take, take any Lord beside God. God. I, have I have not, not seen, seen here in Dearborn in the United States, States anyone taking, worshiping, worshiping any idol. idol. But, but indeed, indeed we, do. we do, we do, even, even Muslims. Muslims. We, take we take goddess, goddess beside, beside God. Who? Who? Our, our cash, cash. Our, our money, our, our lust, our, our desires. desires. The, Quran the Quran says, Have you seen those who take their desires as their God? There are people who follow their desires. They don't follow their Lord. Whatever their desires, tell them they do. Most people do that. Most people follow their desires rather than following God. When we say when we say we worship God, have you ever reflected on the word worship? What does, what does worship, worship mean? Worshiping, worshiping means obeying. 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 When, when I, I say I worship God, God it, it means basically, basically I obey God. God. Do, we Do we really obey, obey God? God? We, we obey God, God when, when it fits, it fits our, our interest. interest. When, when it is, it is okay, okay with us. When we, when we like, like it. it. The minute, the minute they converge, they converge their, their path, path get get depart, depart, I'm sorry, from, from one, one another, another my, my interest in God, who do, who do I follow? Who do, who do I obey? I obey, I obey, I obey my, my interest, my, my desires, and, and I, I put God, God on the shelf. shelf. Most, Most people do that. that. Most people do that. that. They, they worship God. God when, when it, is it is convenient, convenient. But, but when, when it, it becomes detrimental, detrimental and it becomes hectic and, and it becomes a liability to follow, to follow God, God bye. Bye, bye, bye to God. God. That's, That's what, what most of us do. do. There, was there was a guy, guy. His, his name is Abdul Malik, Malik ibn, ibn Marwan. He's, he's a cousin of Muawiyah. So, so Muawiyah died, died. Who, who became the next, the next caliph? Yazid. Yazid died, died after three years. 
and his son Khalid became the next caliph. By the way, Subhanallah, Subhanallah. Yazid, as bad as he was, as wicked as he was, as villain as he was, Allah gave him a good son, Khalid, who said, "You know what? I'm not going to be Khalifa. I'm not fit for the Khilafah. This is not ours." I resign. Look, Look what, what my dad, dad did. Look, Look what, what my grandfather, grandfather did. A lot, a lot of corruption. And, and that is enough for us, for, for our family. family. I'm, not I'm not going, going to accept the Khilafah to be the next caliph. He, he resigned. So, so who, who became, became the next caliph? A cousin of Muawiyah. His name is Abdul Malik. Abdul Malik never thought... In a, In a million years, years he will become a caliph one day. Never, Never thought. So what, so what did he do? He used, he used to sit in the masjid, the masjid almost 24-7, almost, in Medina. In Medina. And, he and he opens the Quran. The Quran. And, he and, he and he reads. And he reads. And he reads. Every time you go inside the masjid, who do you see? Abdul Malik. Malik. Reading, reading Quran, Quran and praying. praying. So, so much, much so that, that he was called Hamamat al Haram, the bird of the Haram. You know, you know if, if you, you go, go to those ancient shrines, shrines you, you see, see there are birds hovering. hovering. They, are they are always there. there. So, so this, this man used to, used to sit and, and spend, spend time in the, in the Prophet mosque, so, so much so that, that they called him the bird of the Haram. 24 7. He, he is there praying and reading Quran. Till, till they, they came, came and told him, you know what? what? We, have we have news, news for you. you. This, is this is what? They told, they told him, you're, not the, you're, you're the, the next caliph. Because, because Yazid's Yazid son refused, refused the khilafah, khilafah and, and you became. This, this is me? And I'm the new caliph. He said, said, yes. yes. History, History says, this, this is, is what he did. He was, he was reading the Quran. He closed the Quran. He kissed it. He put it on the side and he says, Hada firaqu bayni wa baynak. Why? Why? That was the last time he read Quran. That was the last time he saw Quran. He went to the royal palace and he became one of the most, the most brutal Umayyad caliphs. Killing people, prosecute, persecuting people. And this man used to appear as someone who worships God. But did he really worship God? He pretended that he was worshiping God. But when he was given the chance, he proved to people that he was worshiping his ego and his own interest. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Every now and then emphasize this, this point. Allah tushriku bihi shay'a. Do not ascribe another God, be it your cash, be it your power, be it your family, be it your whatever. Do not associate another God with God. Only worship God and don't worship anyone other than God. That's the first one. The first commandment. What is the second one? What is the second moral commandment? Be kind to your parents. I have spoken many times about being kind to parents. But subhanallah, my dear brothers and sisters, this, there's something about this religion, the religion of Islam, that tells us that no matter what, you always need to keep good relationships with your parents. There is no justification whatsoever. A while ago, a couple came to me, so I would do their katbik tab. Now obviously, one of the conditions is that if the girl is, has not been married before, the father has to agree. Now, I found out that the father 
of the bride has not given his blessing. So, <clears throat> when I ask, what is going on? Where is the father? The father is gone. So, I need to talk to him to get his blessing. So, he is not there. When I investigate, I find out that the, the parents were divorced. I mean, the grooms, the, I'm sorry, the bride's parents were divorced. And this bride has not seen her father in years, in years. Now, someone, not the, not the bride, was trying to push me, to pressure me to, yalla, hurry up, let's do the cat maktab. I said, I'm sorry, I can't. Why? Why you can't? She has not seen the father in 10 years, in 15 years. This is exactly the point. This is exactly the point. Because she has not seen her father in 10, 15 years, he has to go and get his blessing. A wife, you know, here in the U.S., I remember one time I was in California, I went to see my teacher, my professor, the university, and I remember she had a last name and that I known her with, but then when I went to see her, there was a different last name. So I was kind of surprised, I mean, how this happened, the professor changed her last name. Then I realized she got divorced. So in this country, women can change their last name based on who is the last husband. So, if you are Elizabeth Taylor, you must have changed your last name maybe nine, ten times, depending on how many husbands you have uh, changed. So, they keep changing the last name based on the husband they have. Now, a woman can do that if she changed her husband. But can a son or daughter do that as well? Can I change my last name? Kazwini? I will be always Kazwini. Whether I talk to my father or not, I will be my father's son. It doesn't change the equation. Whether my parents are in good terms or not, I will always carry my father's name. I will always be my father's son. And if I'm a daughter, I will always be his daughter. That's not going to change. That's a fact. Because of that, because of that fact, I'm stuck. I need to be a good son, a good daughter. If my mother is not happy with my husband, but with her husband, that's her business. You just watch. You stay neutral between your father and your mother. You, dead, you don't get involved. Many people get involved. They take the side of the father or the mother. Mostly girls take the side of the mother and boys take the side of the father. And that's wrong. When there is dispute between my father and mother, even if it leads to divorce, I need to stay neutral. Meaning, in my heart, I can sympathize one of the, with one of them if I deem that person is, <clears throat> you know, experiencing injustice. But to practically, I need to keep, my, I need to maintain my relationship with both, with my father and with my mother. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps reminding us, وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا Always be kind to your parent, whether they are divorced or not. Whether your father took care of you when you were young or not. Whether he was stingy with you, frugal or was not, it doesn't matter. How he treated you, it doesn't matter. It doesn't change the outcome. That as a son, as a daughter, I must be good with my parents, with my mother or with my father. Sometimes I hear people saying, and subhanAllah, it really it strikes me. When I hear some people say, I will never forgive my mother. What do you mean you will never forgive me? What do you mean? Explain to me. She was bad to me when I was young. 
Yeah, she could be. She could be. But that doesn't give you the power to say, I will never forgive my mother. That doesn't give you that power. If anything, she can say this about you. A parent needs to forgive or not forgive his or her children. It's not the other way around. I, as a child of my parents, am not permitted to say I forgive my parents. Who am I to say I forgive them or not? You know, in the Quran, subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes so intricate on how we deal with our parents. Allah says, وَاخْفِضْ لَهُمَا جَنَاحَ الذُّلِّ مِنَ الرَّحْمَةِ وَاخْفِضْ لَهُمَا جَنَاحَ الذُّلِّ مِنَ الرَّحْمَةِ If I want to translate this into English, in, in, into modern English, it means that always not only be humble before your parents, be humiliated. You know, humiliating is, humiliation is not a good thing, right? God doesn't want us to be humiliated. Only in one scenario, it is okay to be humiliated. And that is when you are dealing with your parents. Meaning, meaning, don't bring your pride when you talk to your parents. Be the most humble person. Lower your head and lower your voice. And even if they yell at you and they scream at you, always lower your head and lower your voice and look like as if you are humiliated. That is the only time God permits you to be humiliated or to look humiliated before your parents. Then after that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَقُلْ لَهُمَا in Arabic, when I want to express my frustration with someone without rumbling too much, without talking too much, I say, Oof. I don't want to talk too much. So I would rather, you know, keep my mouth shut. But I let this expression of frustration go by saying, Oof. Which means, visibly, I'm irritated, I'm frustrated, but I don't want to say much. I don't want to open my mouth. I just say, oof. Allah says, you know what? When it comes to your parents, you're not even allowed. Shut up completely. With all due respect. Don't say oof. Well, if I said oof, I didn't say much. Well, you said not too much. When I say off to my mother or to my father, it means I am so frustrated, but out of respect for you, I don't want to say much. Well, if I really respect my parents, I'm not even allowed to say off. I'm not allowed to be visibly, visibly uh, edgy or frustrated. If I'm frustrated, I need to keep my frustration inside. So if someone sees me, he does not even notice that I'm frustrated. Because I'm not allowed to pretend that I'm frustrated with my parents. I am allowed to pretend that I'm frustrated with my kids, with my wife, with my friends. But not with my parents. I'm not even allowed. That how much Islam respects parents. That you do not have the luxury of showing your frustration on your father or on your mother. You can't. You have to be extremely, extremely respectful. It borders fearing them. You know, there is a there is a borderline between fearing someone and respecting them. We respect the authority. We respect the police. And we fear the police, right? So, 
Imam Zayn al Abidin, when he does his dua in that beautiful book, Al Sahif al Sajjadiyya, that most of us hardly read, in the Sahif al Sajjadiyya, Al Imam Zayn al Abidin speaks about how he handles his parent. He prays to God, he's praying, God teaches him the proper protocol with which he can address his parents. He says, Allahumma ja'alni. Listen to this. Allahumma ja'alni. Uhibbuhuma hubba al-umm al-ra'uf. Wa ahabahuma haybat al-sultan al-asuf. Beautiful. How eloquent. He says, God, make me love my parents as if they are my children. You all love your children. And you all love your parents. But how, who do you love more? Without confession, you love your kids more than you love your parents. So there is no doubt we all love our parents. But the question is how much we love them. Some people, most people love their parents, but not as much as they love their children. Al Imam Zayn al Abidin begs God to make him love his parents as much as he loves a mother loves her baby. But right after that he says, Wajalni Ahabahuma Haybat al Sultan al Asuf. Yet as you make me love them as if they are my children, make me fear them as if they are tyrant. You know how we fear tyrant? We fear them. I need not only to love my parents, I need to fear them and respect them. I need to have a sense of awe before them. That's number two. Number three. This ayah was revealed 14 centuries ago, but as if it's been revealed this week. Allah says, do not kill your children due to the fear of poverty. Do you know, my dear brothers and sisters, that in this country, in the most richest country, over 1.4 million fetus is killed, aborted every year for fear of what? For fear of poverty. She is a teenager. She doesn't have a job. She became a pregnant. And because this baby has become a liability for her, what does she do? The shortcut is to go and abort. Allah says, do not abort the baby. Do not kill the baby for the fear of poverty. نَحْنُ نَرْزُقُكُمْ وَإِيَّاهُمْ I will take care of you. I will feed you. I will feed you and I will feed your children. We always think that we feed our children, isn't it? That every one of us thinks that we feed our children. So is this a true statement or a false statement? We feed our children. The true statement is that God uses us to feed our children. We do not feed our children. God uses us to feed our children. There are millions of orphans around the world and they are still being fed. They are being fed. They have no parents, but they are being fed. Because when they lost their parents, God commissioned other people to feed them. So, Allah uses me to feed my children, but in fact, it is Him who feeds my kids. So if I am gone for one reason or another, God can replace me with someone else because he is, he is the one who feeds my kids. I'm only an instrument. I'm only an instrument for feeding my children. Allah feeds my children through me. If I am gone, Allah can use another person. وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا أَوْلَادَكُمْ مِنْ إِمْلَاقٍ نَحْنُ نَرْزُقُكُمْ وَإِيَّاهُمْ do not kill your children due to the fear of poverty, for I sustain you and them. I take care of them. So, 
The question comes that then why there are so many hungry people? If God feeds everybody, then why there are so many hungry people around the world? There are millions of people in Africa and Asia. In Yemen right now, in Yemen, there are millions of people facing starvation. So you're telling me God feeds everybody. But yet, I see millions of people starving. So how does that work? How do I reconcile both facts? The fact of God feeding people. And there are millions of hungry. The answer is, that's not God's making. This is a human being making. I mentioned this so many times. That... In America alone, every family, every household, every single household, average of course, average. How many households? Maybe 100 million. If we have 350 million people living in this country, we're talking about 80 to 100 million families. Every family throws away and dumps in the dumpster every year, what is equivalent to $1,500 of good food, edible food. Every family, every family. Now, do you know how much that would be? If you want to accumulate all that food and we want to distribute it to the needy and poor people and starving individuals around the world, there will be not one starving individual. So there is enough food. God created enough food, enough resources. But it is the greed and the selfishness of the human himself that makes one person extremely rich, throwing so much food in the garbage, wasting a lot of food, yet another one sleeping with no food, with an empty stomach. So this is not God's making. This is a human's making. Humans are doing this to themselves. Not God. God created enough food. There is plenty of food for everyone. And no matter whether the population of the world was 1 billion, 2 billion, 3 billion, or 7 billion now, or it could be 14 billion in 50 years, God has created and will create enough food for everybody. But it is us, it is us, it is a human beings who are so selfish and so brutal and often so ruthless. 14 million people now are suffering in Yemen. Why? Ask yourself why. Because of one person, one arrogant person who decided to keep those people suffering till God knows when. One person can decide the fate of 14 million people. One person, vicious, greedy, selfish, brutal, can decide the fate of 14 million people. So, is this fair? Is this Allah's making? No. No. Then you may tell me, then why God would allow MBS to do this? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decide. Allah decides to keep us free beings. This, this is the meaning of having a free will. If Allah interferes in every single act, then we will be robots. We will not be human beings. Because we are free human beings and because God had privileged us with this free will, he decided to let us exercise our free will. But he will be holding us accountable in the day of judgment and sometime even in this world. وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا أَوْلَادَكُمْ مِنْ إِمْلَاقٍ نَحْنُ نَرْزُقُهُمْ وَإِيَّاكُمْ Time is up and I need to finish here. My dear brothers and sisters, I did announce this a few weeks ago. But uh, the date has been changed. There is a fundraising aimed at helping the 
orphans in Karbala, Iraq. You know, my father founded an orphanage in Karbala in 2007. And this orphanage, it's a huge compound now that shelters over 6,400 6, orphans. Some of you have visited the orphan, orphanage in Karbala. So there will be a fundraising on November 8th. It was supposed to be on October 12th, but it was changed to November 8th at Nadi bin Tijbeil. So I encourage you, my dear brothers and sisters, to buy your ticket. Our sister, Hajjana Dagtayma, have a ticket. Also, you can find the ticket at the uh, reception area. Make sure you buy your ticket for yourself and for your family member and attend. Orphans are orphans. It doesn't matter their color, their race, their ethnicity, not even their religion. Not even their religion. If there are atheists, atheists, assuming there are atheists, orphans, we're supposed to take care of them. Because orphans need help. And Quran encourages us to help orphans regardless. So I commend you, my dear brothers and sisters. Uh, by asking you to buy your tickets today for yourself and your family members. And inshallah, we'll see you uh, at this event on November 8th. Allahumma gfir lil mu'mineen wal mu'minat wal muslimin wal muslimat al ahya'i minhum wal amwat tabi' allahumma baynana wa baynahum bil khayrat innaka mujibu al-da'awat innaka qadil hajat innaka ala kulli shay'in qadir وإلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات نقرأ السورة المباركة الفاتحة والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته